All right, let's get started. Hello, everybody. On behalf of FirstBit Technology, I would like to warmly welcome all of you to today's webinar, Mastering Data-Driven Decisions in Pro Basketball, with our guest speaker, Dominic Deodoro, performance coach from BBL team Rasta Fechter. My name is Christoph Rottensteiner, and I will be your host for today's event. Today's webinar is being recorded, and you will all receive the recording after the webinar. The webinar is scheduled um, to last approx approximately about 45 minutes. And please remember, anytime during the presentation, we encourage all of you to place questions via the chat section. And one good thing is also, maybe for some of you, you can also ask questions anonymously if you prefer. Well, okay, let's see uh, what's waiting for us today. So we have a quite powerful, compelling agenda ahead covering topics such as weekly periodization, player trend recognition, and how FirstBit can help during on-court rehab. Um, after the presentation, we will also have a question and answer session. And this gives you definitely in the end also hopefully um, opportunities to get um, yeah, also your own questions answered. Maybe for all of you who, uh, yeah, who are not uh, a little bit unfamiliar with FirstBit, I will would like to say a couple of words about our company. So we are a Finnish-based company and have been pioneers in the use of physiological analytics to improve sports performance for more than two decades. The first bit sports platform is nowadays used by over 1,500 teams across the world. And when it comes especially to basketball, um, we support almost 100 teams across top leagues, including the NBA, NCAA, Serie A, or as already mentioned, and from where our guest speaker today comes from the basketball Bundesliga in Germany. All right, um, yeah. Moving on, I, I'm, I'm now happy to introduce today's presenter, Dominic Theodora, performance coach from Rasta Fechter, as already mentioned. Tom, we know you had a intense work and travel schedule in the past weeks or yeah, years. So we are really appreciating um, you are taking the time to be with us today. Welcome, Tom. Well, Christoph, uh, thank you so much. And uh, also in general, uh, to to first beat, thank you so much for considering me doing this. I'm uh, I'm very excited, a little bit nervous, but I think that's normal. I'm looking forward to this uh, webinar, uh, and in general, I just try to give you insights of how how I deal with the system, um, and hopefully some of you can pick a few things up, um, maybe can tweak a few things how they use the system and. Uh, I can already say now afterwards, if you want to reach out to me, that is, uh, I would really welcome that because then we can exchange uh, infos. Uh, in terms of, um, of myself, uh, I, uh, well, I um, did a master of education in 2015. My, uh, the two subjects that I was studying was uh, physical education in English, but then somehow because of my personal history of back pain, um, I was always very interested in the performance side of things because I was ask, always asking myself, okay, how I can stay healthy and play basketball because I played basketball myself, not professionally. I was in a pro B for a year. This is like the third league in uh, in Germany, but always at the end of the bench. So still, I was in, um, interested in getting my uh, yeah my health situation figured out, and that was the way when I started like reading into performance in general. Uh, and that's, this led to the fact that I actually became the strength and conditioning coach for BG Göttingen. And over there I worked for six years. And then the whole coaching staff and me and the head coach, we went to Bamberg. Um, been working, um, well, I was working there then for two seasons. And uh, last year I actually uh, went to Rasta Fechter and uh, since then, I'm the performance coach over here. Just briefly about my my background. Great, thanks, Tom. And um, to be honest, also maybe many of our participants noticed this, or the Trasta Fechter team is currently quite well known and present uh, based on the latest success and is passionate fan base, especially. 
And therefore, I'm really happy, as I said, um, that you are willing to provide us some insight about data-based um, yeah, working uh, at Rasta. And also, um, may I ask you if you could like just tell a bit, a little bit like how everything started and how you use uh, FirstBit on a daily basis? Yeah, sure. Um, so how I got into FirstBit, it was actually an interesting story because when I got to Bamberg, um, I said it before, the whole coaching staff from, from Gerningen went to, to Bamberg. And uh, in the second year, at the start of the second season, the head coach that I was working for the last seven years, he got released. And, you know, if you work seven years with a head coach, then you develop, of course, your own relationships and you develop the way how you do things on the court. Also in terms of, you know, uh, how to uh, schedule practices. Um, and when the new co coach came in, in Bamberg, he told me that he would really uh, like me to work with a monitoring system. And we happened to have first, first beat in Bamberg. And that's, that's the way uh, how it actually started. Um, and back then I was working like a good friend of mine was the physical therapist. Uh, his name uh, was uh, Stefan Dahl. And when the new coach asked us for, <clears throat> for working with a monitoring system, you know, the first four days we locked ourselves in into the office and we were really trying to figure out the system. We were trying to get to know the different parameters. It was a little bit like um, Mladen Jovanovic says it in his book, Strength Training Manual, volume one, if I'm, if I'm correct. It was a little bit about like exploring and exploiting. So and initially we tried to explore as many things as possible. And we also tried to figure out how these things uh, then react once we were using the system on court and through time, yeah, we got to know the system. We got to know the, a little bit more inside knowledge, and then we were able to exploit it a little bit more because then we basically, both of us, we were constantly talking and we were always asking ourselves, okay, how can we use the system in order to be as efficient, uh, as possible? Um, and in the end, you know, through focusing on that, yeah, I think we were able to figure out what was important and what was maybe not as important. And this is basically how the how it started uh, for me using first speed. Great. So um, the next thing, uh, I think what's really interesting, um, when do the players wear the system? Um, and this year we, or well, yeah, I can say we decided that I want the players to wear the system basically, of course, at every team practice. They need to wear it uh, for individual workouts. They, <clears throat> they need to wear it. Uh, they don't need to wear it in the, um, during weight sessions because I will put this in manually. Um, but they also need to wear it if they come in by themselves. If they, for example, on an off day, if they feel that uh, that they want to get some shots up, uh, they also need to wear it. So they wear it this season, they wear it more than they usually wore it this season, uh, season before, because, and I think this will make more sense once we get to the point where we talk about, um, yeah, how to recognize trends, but I just want to know as much as possible, um, because that gives us, of course, a bigger picture, uh, they also don't wear it during games because that's just something we decided. We just don't want that. Uh, of course, uh, it would be great if they could wear it during the games, but we just want, want, want to take this away from them during the games. But what I do, of course, I put the, the, the data in manually based on the playing time after games because that also needs to be taken into consideration. All right, then I would suggest we come usually a lot of coaches sometimes ask me, okay, Dom, how do you, how do you guys uh, schedule a practice week? Um, this, what you see here, this is something that I came up with like during the last two years for this season, I tweaked it a little bit uh, and everything you see on there is based on my experience using, uh, using first beat. Um, and in general, this gives us an orientation for a 
a practice week. I got to say, we don't play international. So that's why we have more practices because, you know, we don't play really, we don't really play during the week. Um, and what I created here, it's just, you see it, you see it on top five day prep, four day prep, three day prep, two day prep and one day prep. Um, I prefer, prefer the four day prep if the schedule allows it. So if we, if we uh, to take a closer look <clears throat> to the four day prep, this would mean we play Saturday and we play again next week, Saturday. What we then do is after the game. So let's say we, Sunday is then for us a, a recovery day. Um, and the Monday would be off and Tuesday we would start with our practice week. What you see there, this is all based on the movement load parameter. So on the external metric that, uh, that first beat provides. Again, this is uh, not again, but on top of that, it, it is based on average movement load values for the team. I will come to individual loads once we go on. So just that you have heard, heard about this, that these are average loads. Um, what you also see, what I like to do if possible, <clears throat> I would like to start the practice week with uh, an introduction day. So the introduction day would then, game, would then be game day minus four. So why I start with this or why I preferring starting with this will also come at the end of our presentation. Um, after that, we would like to have a high day is then, is then the red, yeah, it's then game day minus three would be a high day. And then we lower it already. And one day before the game is, it's maybe less for 60 max 70 minutes. Um, what you also see on the, on the, in the different boxes is my suggestion of how many live minutes we, we go for each practice. And again, this is also based on my experience with the coach I'm working with right now. Um, I believe that, that, that my job, it, it is not my job to tell the head coach what kind of drills we need to do, because I think I would be stepping out of my world then a little bit too much. Um, so that is why, why I said in the beginning, this is like an orientation also for the head coach. Okay, today, what day do we have? How should I plan my practice? And in the end, this is how it works here when we have team practices. <clears throat> the coach already by now knows, okay, where, where, should we, where should we head towards? And during the end of practice or when we get to the end, he's always coming to me and is asking me, okay, Dom, where are we? Uh, can we do another drill? Should we maybe stop? And I am then able to give him my opinion based on the data that we have also observed uh, the previous days or weeks. Um, and this gives us then a little reference. And I think this is important because in, uh, in my opinion, in professional sports, you wanna see tendencies, I, uh, I do believe in. So and this gives us a way of like, yeah, trying to uh, base our practice week accordingly. What I also have to say, that most of the time there, there's a big difference between theory and practice. If you now, for example, check, when you check the three day, uh, the three day prep uh, on game day minus three, this is, in theory, this would be a high day because it's game day minus three. But this of course depends. And that's why I put there, I hope you can all see my cursor. Uh, that's why I put here live minutes and movement load might vary. Because again, if we come from a recovery day, the first day of practice should not be, player should not get smacked in the face right away with a very intense practice. So that's why this might vary. Um, and if I think about my role, I think my role as a performance co coach is a lot about risk uh, management and hopefully protective decision-making. This is very easy. I think it's a very, it's a very easy way of, of planning. Yeah, and it's maybe not as detailed as possible, but in the end, it gives us a trend. Yeah, it gives us an idea of how we could plan our practices. And you know, I, I know it's not ideal with the, with the average loads for, for different team practices, but we will get to the individual load loads shortly. Um, and I like to give the example 
if you're in a dark room and there's no light in the room, yeah, if you can, this is for me lightning two candles and then you can basically have just a little bit of better, better idea of how things are during practice. I hope this all makes sense. Um, feel free to ask me questions uh, for it at the end of the, the webinar. All right, then let's move on. So now I have to, before I do this, I will now send, uh, show you my, my Excel sheet <laughs> because that's something I, I have tweaked uh, a lot the last month and maybe the last year as well. Um, but this will show you um, basically what, what I'm able to do now is I have each team practice from, uh, from us for each player, like individually analyzed. So if I open that slide now in a second, you know, I might be swamped in the beginning, uh, but it's actually, it is very simple and easy to follow, but I'll explain that uh, to you in a second. Let me first stop the share here. Let me now. Da, da, da. Okay. Christoph, uh, if I think you should see now everything. Um, if not, Christoph, let me know. Uh, I'll just start. All good. So, I can see it well. So. Okay, perfect. So what do you see here? Uh, between the orange columns. Yeah, this is, this is the practice data for... <clears throat> for one player, player six in that case. Yeah, uh, I have this for the whole team and I'll update this basically uh, on a daily basis. Um, let me go back to player six. Uh, let me first of all go through my, the parameters that I look at. Um, maybe you guys look at different parameters. That is where I am right now. And maybe I will change that in the future. But as of now, I'm pretty happy with, the, uh, with these parameters. So I, I always look uh, at the trimp. I look at the movement load. And this is something that is not really officially out there. It is the movement uh, efficiency. And Christoph, I've read that in the beginning when I, when I was starting to use the system. I read that somewhere online on your, uh, on your homepage. Um, and then I was like, hmm. Okay, why not? Uh, then I just put it in myself. Um, and it's basically the, the movement lot divided by the trim. And then that, that gives you a number as you can see here. Yeah? So based on my experience, what I can say now, everything between 1.5, 1.6, let's put it like this has room for improvement. Everything between 1.6 and 2 point something is okay. And everything above 0.2, I actually quite like, yeah. Um, let me go on, we come back to this. Then I look at the Epoch Peak. Then uh, red is for me just the, the time that the player spent above 90% of the, of the heart rate max. And then here we have the percentage of the heart rate max, the average percentage during the whole practice session. This is something I started using this year, but ah, I don't know, I'm, it's not that I, it doesn't give me that much info it's nice to know but maybe i i kick it out because i always try to be as efficient as possible then what i look at is the acute workload here is the acute to chronic workload ratio and in the end this is the trim total of the day um and since the topic uh of this section is how to recognize trends so on august this is here the date on august 7 we started our preseason and what you can see here Trim values in the first week are pretty high. Movement load values are so-so. I think not very high, also not very low. Yeah, And then you have the movement efficiency right here. And now, like I said before, so this is almost, almost everything is below 1.5, which is normal in the beginning, because what I usually see is, yeah, if players need to start practice again, uh, in the beginning, it tends to be very... Yeah, it comes to a high cost. Um, and then you see also the epoch peaks. So what I wanted to show you now is if I if I now check the the weeks, so you see go through the movement efficiency right here, and then you have an average value of 1.3. If we go through the <clears throat> through the second week, ah, it gets a little better. The average is now at 2.21. If you just look at the averages from all the single practices. 
So then he got a little, got a little uh, TFL tightness, so he couldn't practice for a few days. And as the weeks go on, what you can see then is, if you check the movement, <clears throat> the movement efficiency, for example, in this week, now we're all of a sudden uh, at 3.13. Next week, yeah, it's 2.89. So what that basically tells me is, because the movement load is kind of the same like it was in the first week. So in the, now I'm able to say, okay, I think this guy, his fitness is improving because he is getting used to the stress he experiences on the court. So the, the, the movement load stays relatively the same, but the internal load goes down. And then, it, yeah, it tells me that he is getting more efficient. Yeah? And the good thing, if I know this now, I mean, we can... I have now another <clears throat> another way of uh, showing this. We could now go to the to the weekly ratios. So, if you look at this here, so this is again one player. Yeah, this is the same player we were just looking at here in the beginning. We have how many team practices a week did we did this player did this player have in week one, week two, and so on and so on. Um, then we have the total movement load, the total trim. But for me, this here is very uh, interesting to see. You have the average shrimp per per team practice and the average movement load per team practice in this week. And if you now see, I think we can for sure say that the shrimp goes down, but the movement load stays relatively the same. So again, so that's why how you can see. And in this case, of course, this is uh, this is something that I would like to know because if I don't have this, I can only uh, yeah, I can only think of uh, that the player is probably getting better. His fitness is probably improving. But now I basically see it because we, uh, we use the system constantly. Um, and now I just want to show you one other example. This is from a player who was here last year already. And here you basically see the same tendencies. Yeah, First week, high trim, yeah? 140 trim on average. Yeah. Second, second week, again, a tendency. Yeah, of course, I understand. No practice will ever be the same. Yeah, but still, we see a tendency. We see a trend. So it goes down. In this week, this is different because that's, the, that's where the week, uh, that was the week when we were in Spain on training camp. We only had the gym uh, once a day. So our practices got a little longer, got a little extended. That's why this week in general was for everybody uh, really tough. But if you now, he had like a little, a little injury coming up. But if you now look at this here, you see the trim values again go down, whereas the movement load <clears throat> values stay relatively the same. Again, to back this up, we can also look at this here again. You can look at this here. First week, here it goes down. Third week, this was the training camp. Yeah, it was pretty high. You see also here the movement load efficiency was lower again. But now we can say that the trend is continuing to go in the right direction. The good thing is, if I know all this, for example, if we look at player seven, so here he has he's, uh, the movement efficiency in this week, 2.7, 2.2, 2.5, 3.0. If let's say next week we practice, and all of a sudden he is, he is at a, at a 1.6 again, then I'm like, okay, hmm, that's interesting. What I can do then is at least go and talk to him and ask him what's going on. Um, and that's why I also like organizing the, the Excel sheet like this, because I can tell you it takes me like 20 or 25 minutes after each practice to put these numbers in. But because I put the numbers in, I right away have like a little feeling of what is going on if something is like out of whack. Yeah. And then I, uh, I have chances to communicate. So basically it gives me chances to communicate. Um, what I've just shown you were just positive examples um, where players are getting better. We had it last year. We had it this year that for, for, <clears throat> for some players, the efficiency would stay where it is, even though we were already like five, six, seven weeks in practice. So it would revolve around one, five, one, six, one, three, one, four. And what I was able to see during live monitoring that uh, this particular player during during like during water breaks or when the coaches were were uh, explaining something for example 
he would just not recover. So he would always like in the first beat in the he would when when players are in the gray zone, so below below fifty percent during practice when the coach was explaining something, or when they were in the in the first green. Most of the players were in the gray or green zones, and this particular player would never really get to there. So during practices, he would never be able to recover uh, to also get into these heart rate uh, ranges. Um, and for me, I'm a big believer in training the aerobic system. Um, for me, I was thinking, okay, good. His aerobic system maybe needs a little bit of work. Um, and what we did then, I understand if you want to train the aerobic system during the season. It, yeah, I cannot tell a player to sit 45 minutes on the bike. He's probably <laughs> look at me and is going to be like, hey, are you serious now? So what we tried and this this player was really receptive for it because what I did, I showed him his data um, in the uh, in the dashboard and I compared it to another player who's playing his position. And then we looked at the, the average percentage of his heart rate max throughout the practice session. And what we then could see is that the other guy, he would always be way lower than the player I'm talking about. And this um, really helped this guy because he he found it fascinating. Um, and what we then we tried to figure out a way of improving this. And what we ended up with, um, I told him that he when we when we have basketball when we have team practice that he should come in uh, or that he should go on the bike on the little air bike that we have ten minutes prior to us starting, not to exhaust himself but to get his system going a little bit after the. The team practice, uh, I let him also sit on the eco bike as his cool down. And that's what we did two, three weeks. And the other thing he implemented, he just implemented some 20 to 25 minutes walks before uh, he went to bed. And through time, what happened, his efficiency would, would go up. So instead of being between 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, he would be... Two 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 three two five two one two three two five two six, um, and I was happy that it would show in the numbers. But I, of course, was even more happy that he could also tell me, "Hey Dom, I also feel way better on the court." And what you could also observe um, that during breaks, water breaks, coaches explain something. He would then all of a sudden drop also into the green zones. And that was for me very interesting, um, and that's why I think it's uh, it's important, very important to also have an idea about the individual data for each player. Um, and of course, this gives me a daily snapshot of where we are with each player, because I can see always here the acute workload, the acute to chronic workload. Um, and the trim total for that particular day. And if I can assume that there might be a question coming up where like, okay, when do you interfere? Um, during like in the morning when we have individuals or when we have team practice players, if they want, they can ask the assistant coaches for, for another individual workout before practice. And what we do is um, if a player asks for that, I always, the assistant coach reaches out to me. And if I think his acute workload is really high or is way higher than, you, than it was uh, the last previous seven days before, then I can make a, uh, let's say, then I can make a better decision. I can say, okay, yeah, do it. Or I can say, no, maybe let him rest this morning. Let him only do the team practice. So this is how the, the individual decision-making also comes a little bit into play. Okay, this was long. Uh, I'll try to keep going because we uh, we have... A lot of stuff on the agenda. So I will close this. I will open the other screen again. So I should be back. Give me a second. That's what we just did. All right. Here we are. I hope everybody can see everything, Christoph. Does it work? Yes. Perfect. All good. All right. Um, now, how to use previously recorded data during practice. This is the slide I also came up with. We see here the different players. Yeah, On top is the team. We have game day minus four, game day minus three, game day minus two, game day minus one. 
on the bottom, we have average shrimp and movement load data, which is something I will speak, uh, speak about after. But because I know it's important to have the individual stuff as well, this sheet I have always in front of me when we have team practice. Um, so because these are the average scores or values, data points, um, for each individual player. I give you an example. That's what happened last year at least three or four times. Let's check game day <clears throat> minus one. We have, we just go to, uh, let's say, let's take player, player seven. Yeah? This is his average trimp on all the uh, game day minus one practices we had so far. Uh, and this is the same then uh, for the movement load, his average movement load for all the practices on game day minus one. Then uh, we have here the minimum trim that he ever experienced on that day, the trim maximum that he experienced on that day, the movement load minimum and the movement load max. So when I know this, and that's what happened, for example, last year, we were in the middle of practice and let's assume it was this guy. And in the middle of practice, he already had a trim of oh, 75 or 80. And I was able to see this because I knew what his usual trim would look like on a day like this. So I was able to go to him, talk to him and ask him if, uh, if everything is all right. What he told me then, yeah, you know, Dom, I didn't sleep well. I was, woke up late. I was kind of in a rush. I didn't have breakfast because on game day minus one, we always practice in the morning. Uh, I just feel terrible. I feel a little sick. And um, then I told him, oh, okay, interesting. I was about to say. And then he looked at me. I was like, how do you know? And I told him, yeah, I saw it because I recognized it in your, in your, in your data because your data seems is usually below of what you're right now. And then he was fascinated. He came to me, uh, he, he did not finish practice because I, I told the head coach that we have to maybe, you know, take care of this guy for the rest of practice. And after practice, he came to me and told me, man, that's incredible. How did you, how were you able to recognize this? So, and then of course this, from a coaching perspective, this helps me of course to, you know, to build trust and you know what I'm talking about. I don't want to use the word buy-in, but I think that's what it is. Um, and yeah, this is how I know next to the average, like in the beginning, when I showed you how I plan a practice week, these are average values, but here having this kind of paper in front of me, I actually also know next to the average values, yeah, what the individual average values for each practice they are. So I can just, make a better decision based on that. Um, and that's something also I created uh, through Excel, which then um, like automatically updates. And I would also be able to go back and only check at the, check the, the last three weeks, for example, if I wanted to, because this is a whole season. All right, let's talk a little bit about the reference data. Uh, because I think a few months ago, it was the end of last year, uh, um, First Beat released this training load, training load guide for basketball coaches. Uh, and I have my own reference values, like based from last year and from this year. Um, so on the left side, you see the, the reference uh, data for um, from first beat, and we uh, we would only like to look now at the at this right here. Yeah, so these are the trim, like the average trim. I uh, talked to your customer success manager, uh, Joel Wenning. By the way, Christoph, you can be happy that you have this guy because uh, I think we have really extensive uh, WhatsApp history because we basically talk on a daily basis. And without him, I wouldn't understand the system the way I kind of understand it right now. So big shoot out to Joel, by the way. Um, so he told me that these reference values are based on um, um, on practices and on games. So they're probably a little higher than my reference values. So for example, if you look at this, um, like a, a, in terms of trim and easy training would be below 68, then between 69 and 137, uh, and hard training would be uh, above 138. Um, let's quickly take also these ones into account. Movement load range, so an easy practice, according to these reference values would be between 93 and 197, 165 and 286, 219 and 368. Um, now let's look at what I put up here. So the, 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 the upper one is from last year. Yeah, so these are team 
reference values. And you see here on game day minus game day minus four, I have an average shrimp of 114 and an average uh, movement load of 229. On game day minus three, it's a little higher uh, and movement. Load, as you remember, I would like to have game day minus three. I would like to have it like I would like this day to be the highest day. Uh, and it sort of also shows that in uh, in the numbers, because this is from the whole last year pro a season. Um, here, get, uh, game day minus two, and here, game day minus one. So minus one, as I said, is pretty short movement load on average of 197. Here, you again, like uh, like it was with the individual uh, overview, you have the, the trim minimum on, like, on, uh, on that particular day, the trim max, movement load minimum, movement load max. So if you now look at our season so far, we are undershooting definitely last year. Definitely. But that, that also has to do with the fact that this season, although we don't play international, our weekly schedule is always a little weird because we play Sunday, Saturday. So these are six days. I prefer seven days. Uh, and then if we play Sunday, Saturday, then we play Saturday, Friday, again, only six days. And that's why the, the, the training load is also a little lower as it would be if we had the Friday, Friday games or the Sunday, Sunday games, uh, because then we could practice also a little harder. So again, this is just a snapshot of where we are right now. And what I, what I wanted to say with this is the fact that in general, compared to the reference values that first be uh, provided, we are undershooting that a little bit. But again, these are also only values for, for our team practices. For nothing else. All right, let's talk about no. Nope, go back. Let's talk about rehab. Very big. I, I tried to cut this a little shorter. Uh, big topic um, that I, I I I love using the system also when it comes to rehab. So what you see here <clears throat> is like an August twenty first player got injured. It was like a muscle injury. Uh, proximal rectus femoris strain. Um, pretty tricky injury, I could say. Um, so what we do usually in the beginning, it's two days or nothing, just for the player to, you know, to get a little rest. And then we always try to, to start as fast as possible within the constraints of the injury, of course. So I provided him a, a program for weights. And we talk to the doctor, to the physios, of course, we talk a lot. And when we think he's ready to, um, to go back to to encored work, what we do then, because you saw the the list that I showed you in the beginning, with where I have every single practice of every uh, each player analyzed, I then have a very good idea of what an intense practice would look like for this particular player. So, for example, on average, let's just give it a number. Uh, movement load of two hundred forty would be. Uh, an intense practice, let's say for this player right here, using this example, or let's say 220, it doesn't matter. Um, what I do then, uh, let me just put it to the side here. What I usually do then, I have the trim right here, the movement load, the movement efficiency. I would then schedule these uh, workouts progressively. So everything that you see here up until individual 14, yeah, is basically me me working with the player on court. And instead of using time for the workouts, I use the movement load because I think this is less arbitrary. Um, so I slowly try to work myself up towards the 220 that we just uh, agreed on. Yeah, this was uh, also his average high low 220. Um, and I do this in a progressive manner. And of course, every day before we start working, I have to ask the player, okay, good. How do you how how do you feel? How does the structure feel? Was yesterday too much? If it was too much, okay, then you have to dial it back a little bit, of course. Um, and doing it like this, I think it gives us a better idea uh, instead of only using time as a reference. So when I do this in in general, um, this uh, these individuals when I start is is a it's, it's basically high control. So it's a lot of linear stuff. 
yeah, and gradually progressed. Throughout the end of the, of the rehab, this needs to go towards high chaos, of course. Um, so my goal is always, I would like to bring the player back to, to a high practice load um, with predominantly low chaos. So because I want to know if the structure is able to endure this. And if the player gives me a good feedback, then I would like the assistant coaches to step in. Uh, and then we, the player needs to experience this high load of 220 um, with, with an assistant coach, where he then is forced to, uh, yeah, to do more chaotic stuff. Yeah? And if a player goes through this two times, this is just our little like rule of thumb. If a player does this two times with an assistant coach and the player gives us a good feedback, then we would slowly introduce him back to practice. But, you know, we're not going to let him go right away full practice. We then start always, again, this is just how we do it. We start, okay, first practice, you're allowed to do one contact drill half court. Second practice, depending on how the first practice went, we can maybe go two contact drills, three contact drills. And at some point, he will be back in practice uh, normally. Um, what else do I look at? I also look at the at the acute training load. If you see this here, I hope you can all see my cursor. It goes up, yeah. And an acute training load at a thousand is is pretty high, yeah. Because I, as you see here, I put everything into first speed. Also, when he lifts weight, I put their manual uh, manual score in. Um, also, when he sits on the bike, he wears the belt constantly. So in the end, we all add up. Yeah, and you see here now, um, this is then the, the point where he got back into team practice and he had a very, a pretty high uh, acute workload. But this is also, for me, that's something desirable. I, I don't want him to have a low uh, workload and jump back into a practice. Um, then I also look at the movement intensity, as you can see here. And um, yeah, in the end, we, we got sort of, no, I wouldn't say very intense, but way more intense than in the beginning, of course. Um, yeah. And you see here also the, the time above 90% of, <laughs> of his heart rate max. So these individual workouts, they are intense, but that's also something I get to uh, get to in a second. I hope this paints the picture a little bit of how I use first beats um, for rehab settings. Let's go on. All right. These are uh, what I'm going to um, present next. These are just my personal first beat observations. Oh, maybe also discoveries um, throughout the last two and a half years. Um, one of our, uh, or the, the head coach of our pro A team, uh, he just told me right away that, that we have better awareness now because what we do, I also track the prospect players from our pro A team. Um, they also wear the, 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 the straps, like the heart rate stuff and the sensors constantly. Um, and there, I also track it in the same way as I track our BBL team. This is, these are like five players that I also track. And based on, uh, on this, we also make decisions because we have a few players who uh, play BBL and Pro A, and sometimes we got to make decisions. If the Pro A, the Pro A plays Friday, the BBL plays Saturday, and the uh, uh, Pro A plays Sunday again, yeah, then we have to make a decision. Is the player going to uh, going to take part in three games? How does it uh, does his acute workload look like? Can we maybe make a better decision by looking at the data? And that's why our Pro A coach uh, told me when I was speaking to him. Uh, his name is Henry Gun. Um, he said right away that since we do it like this, we will just get a better awareness uh, of what's going on with the players. Another thing I, um, uh, I found out, I mean, I think it's common sense, but there's no way you can simulate game demands in basketball practice, at least from the internal load. Um, what I can see with our, with our youth players, they were uh, wearing the, the first speed monitors in each um, preseason game um, and they go up to a movement load of 560 or 570 throughout the whole game of course this is then like with warm-up and everything and 
if uh, one of our youth players uh, of our prospects you know if he averages three or four minutes doing team practice above 90 percent of his heart rate max then if you only look at practices this would be a hard practice for him and then he started wearing it towards the end of the pre i mean not he wore it all the time but towards the end of the season uh, of the preseason he had he was wearing the system and after the uh, after the game we saw that he spent over 20 minutes above 90 percent of the of his heart rate max so that basically tells me that like also from the mental aspects you know it's the fear of making mistakes you have loud music you have you have people watching um it's just different and that's why I would like to say that there's no chance that you can simulate these demands during team practices. Um, something I wanted to uh, talk to uh, before already, the ind individual basketball practices are very taxing. Um, something that I also learned because previously, that's why I, I experienced it. Sometimes we, we said, oh, you only did an individual. Um, but now if I look at the, um, if I look at the data from individual practices, you just accumulate, accumulate trimp and movement load at a much faster rate compared to team practices. Because, it does make sense, you move constantly. Yeah? There, there are rarely any breaks. If you do an individual workout with two other guys, you're constantly moving. So what I'm just trying to say is that these workouts are also very taxing. Um, Youth players in pro practices. Last year, we had a youth guy who would practice with us and back then in the pro B. Uh, in the pro B, he would move way more than with us because with us, you would all, you know, predominantly be on the side. So you wouldn't see the court as often as in the pro B practices. But in these practices, he accumulated way more movement load in pro B, yeah, uh, but less trim. With us in the, B, uh, in the last year in the pro A, he accumulated way less movement load, but way higher trim. My understanding of this is also mental aspects. You're playing with the pros. So you don't want to make a mistake. You put yourself under pressure. Yeah, this goes all, you know, internal parameter, parameters will arise. Uh, game warm-ups are also workouts um, because a lot of guys wear the, the sensors during the game warm-ups because that gives me just a better idea of what I need to put into the system after a game. Yeah, um, And I was also surprised when I saw this, like with the youth play, he had like a movement lot of 150 and a trim of 75. Uh, I was like, mm, that is it's pretty high and I would have never expected it to be that high. Uh, something that I said in the beginning of my presentation, um, I think this is a, this is a very, um, this is also just something that I observed throughout my experience using the system. Whenever we come of a recovery day off day, first team practice, sometimes the team practices, although I don't like it, they are a little bit more intense and we go more full court five on five. What I tend to see is that the internal player load that the trim and the time above the 90 percent of the max heart rate will always be elevated uh, and i think that's because uh the, after an off day i truly believe that the that your entire system drops pretty quick and that the overall capacity to respond to stress starts to to decrease um because your body is getting used to less stress and that's why I always want an introduction day. So just that the player has a chance to start its engine again. Um, and this is basically the reason why we would like to have these uh, introduction days because it also prepares you better for the, for the high day that's coming. So that's just some like an observation uh, that I took throughout the years. Um, and the last uh, bullet point on this uh, on this slide, um, because I also always look at the RPE that the players give me after practices, and I have to say, like first speed data and RPE, in in my experience, are pretty much pretty much the same. I would always say eighty five percent. So if we have a high practice and the internal load or the numbers from first speed are high, most of the time. 
the player also rate the practice pretty high. So that's just an observation I made throughout the <clears throat> throughout the uh, yeah my experience with first speed. Um, yeah, let's move on. Click. Oops. How to communicate the data? Um, to make this quick, I have to say I'm I'm pretty transparent with it. I'm pretty open. Um, it's not that I go to every player and, uh, you know, I could talk for ages about these, uh, about the data, but that's not what I do if I know that the player is not really that interested. But I can tell you, we have four or five guys who always want to know. They, they look at the training report that gets sent to them automatically after team practices. Players want to know about their efficiency. Players want to know about how long, how much time they, they spend in the, in the high heart rate zones. So, I'm pretty open. Uh, I like to communicate uh, it if the player wants to know. Um, and also the coaching staff. The good thing here is because I, I said that that we uh, also have these five prospects who play in the Pro A that we continuously monitor with the with the system. Um, also the coaches from that team, like the assistant coach, he uh, helps me a lot. He always has an iPad now with him and he starts and stops the practice sessions. So now also our... Our pro A team, you know, the coaches, they have an understanding of what's a high load and what's maybe a medium or low load. So, and for me, it's easy whenever I come in in the morning because the pro, the pro A always practice in the evening. I come in in the morning and look at all the data, put it in my Excel sheet. And the good thing is if the guys start and stop the session, it's for me easier to write down the numbers. So um, I think... Communication wise, like I said, I'm very open. If a player wants to know, I tell him. But if I see that a player needs a little bit more work because efficiency is always down, um, then I will also go to him and talk to him. But at the same time, I'll also talk to the guys if they look very good in the numbers. Um, I think that's everything that I can say uh, for this slide. Christoph. Yes, uh, thank you, Tom, uh, for that interesting presentation. It, it was, at least for me, very inspiring and directly relevant uh, to today's topic. I will definitely forward your greetings and hands up to Joel. It's great to hear that our customer care team great is guy. needed <laughs> and, and yeah, also helping you uh, Yeah, maybe to save some time. And, and being involved with clients, that's, I think, one of our strengths, definitely, at first bit. All right. Uh, I really appreciate all the questions we received, but unfortunately, we are a little bit running out of time for this session. Um, we will try, anyway, to answer all the open questions by email in the next uh, 48 hours. Uh, hopefully, that is possible. We got a lot of them, but uh, I picked up one um, I think quite interesting question, which definitely um, is in in more um, team settings often the case that sometimes players are not always training with the main team. So, Tom, actually, how do you do it with players who are not participating with your team? Uh, do you have any insights on that? How do you collect data? Um, Injured players is... or, or players who are not able to join? So, in... Uh... Let's say we speak about the players from the Pro A team that are not in our BBL practice. What I do with them, they all have their, their monitors, so they're required to wear it. If not, they got to bring the coaching staff a bag of Haribo. That's the deal over here. <laughs> I think that's a pretty funny deal, and, uh, and it works. Let's put it like this. Um, uh, so, like I, like, like I previously said, the, the players wear it. The, the, like the coaches from the pro from the pro A, they start and stop the session because they also have an iPad available. And what I do with the data, then when I come in in the morning, I look at it and I write everything down. Yeah? And this is also with injured players. When we have injured players, um, uh, when they, for example, they do bike workouts or they, uh, they do uh, extra lifting because they cannot do anything on the court yet, we record it. We put it. We put these sessions in manually, but we record it. Yeah, and also when they start doing stuff on the court, like individual practices, you know, with the with the coaches from the pro, they always have to wear it. I always see. So my my job basically is 
to track 15, 16 players on a daily basis. Also, when the when the young guys, for example, when they play Pro A, but they also play MBBL, yeah. So they have two games on the weekend. So the coaches from the from the Pro A, uh, or also the coaches from the MBBL, they always send me the the box scores. Uh, and when I receive the box scores, I can look at the minutes. And since and that's maybe one important thing, since everybody accumulates accumulates trim and movement load at a different rate. So everybody is special in their, uh, in their own way. But this is what I know because I see it on a daily basis. And here, that's what I have to say. What I really like about the system uh, is just its practi practicality because uh, our, um, our sports director, Gary Kassentigli, he's, he's very interested in this stuff as well. So for, he also has the app on his phone. And if he watches, uh, if he watches team practice from the Pro A or the BBL, he can basically only open uh, his his smartphone. And since he has the app on there, he can see everything. He receives also the emails, and sometimes he's even faster than I am. And he sometimes even detects a little, like I don't know, something slightly that went maybe was just eye catchy. He detects it, and I get a message before I even get a chance to look at it, everything. So uh, yeah, that. That's what I like about the system. It's very practical. Uh, everybody can use it. Uh, also, when I am, you know, when the pro A practices and I'm in the gym and uh, I, I watch practice, I just open my smartphone boop, and I see everything. And that's something I really like. Great. Thank you, Dom. Uh, um, yeah. I would like really say on behalf of First Beat Technologies, uh, many thanks to you and uh, thanks for spending some time with us this afternoon for all these insights. You said also like you want to uh, or you are willing to share all this information. So yeah, your con sure. contact details um, will be also available. I think you said like maybe on the next slide where you are able yeah. also like um, to find Tom's details, drop him a message if you or follow him via Insta. I'm pretty sure there are also like many interesting stuff what you can find. And also, please remember that this webinar is recorded, so it will be available at, as a podcast and on our website. Yeah, Christoph, again, thank you so much. Uh, like like Christoph just said, if you have something, I think there. I'm always happy to talk about these things. Just send me a message, email. Instagram, even whatever you prefer. And I'll try to get back to you as fast as I can, because I think when we start talking, then I can probably pick up things from you. And that's, that's how we learn. So, and again, thank you so much for, for choosing me doing this webinar. I really appreciate that. Thanks. And uh, for all of you who are still listening, if you are, uh, or your organization interested in joining the first bit sports family, um, have also a look on the news and updates what we are constantly bringing in somehow. They are just like a couple of weeks ago, we released our new weekly training load reporting. And also don't hesitate to contact us directly. Um, I will also, I think on the upcoming slide, if you could press forward there, you will find also directly um, our email contacts, uh, just drop a, a line, I think on the next page, there you can see um, the email address from uh, sports at firstbit.com or you can, of course, uh, contact me directly also. It's christoph.rottensteiner at firstbit.com. And yeah, we are happy to get in touch with you and all the best uh, for you and have a nice afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.